going to look in the scriptures today and, and, uh, and consider the fact that we are celebrating a birthday. Are you ready to celebrate a birthday? Do you know whose birthday it is? The church's birthday, the church of Jesus Christ. And, it, and through the last 2,000 years, this celebration of Pentecost Sunday has been a big deal. I mean, all around the globe. And I think that in our generation, especially, uh, you know, in, in certain churches, it's almost been forgotten. But we, we celebrate the fact that the church was launched on Pentecost Sunday uh, some 2,000 uh, years ago. I don't know how long we're going to be able to say 2,000 years ago, but we've used that for a couple of decades. <laughs> we're rounding in numbers a little bit. Um, but there were three special uh, festivals that would draw people in. There were actually more, but these three were the top festivals that we would see that were Jewish festivals. One was Passover. The other was Pentecost that we're talking about today. And the third was the Feast of Tabernacles. I remember having an aunt and an uncle that always talked about the Feast of Tabernacles. I didn't have a clue what they were talking about. The Jews would gather from literally around the globe. Certainly within a 20-mile radius, they would come in. It was pretty much required that they would come in for these great festivals. But people literally also from around the nation would come. And, you know, I don't know how many of you have been outside of the borders of the United States by show of hands. How many of you have been outside the borders? How many of you have been on missions outside the borders of the United States? And so that experience is a rich experience. I would encourage everyone to have that experience. It is life-changing. Not everything in life will impact you to the degree of going overseas and seeing what another culture is like and recognizing that God so loved America, God so loved the world, sent his son to die on the cross because he so loved the nations, the world. And, uh, and I oftentimes think through different hours of the day, I'll consider the fact that there are those in the underground church, whether it be in China or elsewhere, that are worshiping at certain hours, and, and some of them uh, with uh, a great sense of, of recognition that they could be imprisoned or their lives could be in jeopardy for, for worshiping our God. And so, uh, or, or I consider the tribal situations, the villages, uh, amazing to consider that we have brothers and sisters around the globe and that we around the globe were praying the same prayer. Wasn't that a wonderful thing to be able to pray the prayer? It was a global prayer and we're all on the same page. Oh, I'm telling you, we're looking for God's spirit to move. Amen? Amen. Listen, this is a spearhead. This building right here has been a spearhead for decades, believing the spirit of God is going to move and be pervasive in the D.C. metro area with the ones who have come in here and prayed. So I want you to know as we're seated in these pews, as we're in this building, we're believing for great things to happen in the D.C. metro area. Another amen. Well, the Jews would gather uh, in uh, for Pentecost. And Pentecost literally being translated means 50. It's 50 days after Passover, or what we would consider as 50 days after Easter. And so uh, 50 days after Easter Sunday will always be the Pentecost Sunday. And, um, and it was also known as the uh, Feast of Weeks or the Feast of First uh, Fruits. First Fruits being that people would bring out of their crops and, their, and the benefits that God has given them would bring them to Jerusalem and would give them uh, as unto the Lord. The people would celebrate uh, the goodness of God in that way. And then also uh, the Pentecost Sunday would be uh, a time where it would represent the giving of the law to Moses at Mount Sinai. Over a half a million people would be present in Jerusalem. Again, those sights and sounds and the feeling of that is something I want to bring to us today, that we can consider what it's like to have a half a million people. Anybody been to Jerusalem by a show of hands? You know what it's like to walk through those streets. It's almost like a movie set. It's smaller than I expected it to be. Uh, the walls that are there, it just looks more like a movie set. But when you move through the gates, you begin to, to get a sense for the area. And, and, and if, you're, you know, if you're alive to the Spirit at all, you're thinking of those days where Jesus walked through those streets, where the disciples would walk through those streets, where those uh, that would gather together in Solomon's colonnade would come together, not simply to gather together, but to believe for God to do radical, extreme, and mighty things in the lives of those around them. That's something that I believe that we need to believe for in our day. 
Acts 1.8, Jesus said these words. He's just about to ascend into heaven. Listen to these words. They're powerful. He says to his disciples, to his followers, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Then 120 people will gather in an upper room. They'll be unified. They'll be together. They'll be on the same page. They will not be divided. They will be unified in spirit, believing for the Holy Spirit to come, to pour out, for the power of God to be made manifest. We need to pray such prayers today. We need to be unified today. The small, uh, you know, squabbles, is that the word? These divisions that we see that happen in churches are the enemy's work. We need to be unified and together because if we're unified, watch what God can do in our families. Watch what God can do in this community and in our nation and in the world. I've got one life to live. The Bible says that it's appointed unto man once to die and after that the judgment. I know that Shirley MacLaine is wrong. We don't come back in several different bodies and in several different lives, not according to the word of God. It's appointed unto man once to die and after that the judgment. Therefore, if I have breath in my lungs, if I have one life to live, I want to give everything to Jesus Christ. I want to be without any reservation giving my life as, a, as an offering to the Lord. Do you feel the same? When we come together, if we'll believe for God to pour out his Holy Spirit, to fill us to overflowing, we'll find that God will impact our world, and our world may be our family. Our world may be our, our, our you know, colleagues where we work. Our world, I believe, is also the nations of the earth that we prayed for today, certainly our own backyard of Washington, D.C. Acts 2, 1 through 4. When the day of Pentecost came, wow, that's a powerful thought just by it. The day of Pentecost came, the, the moment in which it's time, there's a now. They were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. What happened in that upper room was not meant to be simply for those that were known as the disciples. It was not simply for the 120 that were gathered in the room. God wanted what happened in that upper room to spill out, first in their own backyard of Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and beyond until this Holy Spirit that we're talking about, this person of the Trinity, that the Holy Spirit would be large and in charge in the lives of all of the followers of Jesus Christ. And that's the way it's to be today. That the Holy Spirit is in us, moving through us, empowering us, guiding us, giving us wisdom that's beyond our own wisdom, words that go beyond our ability to know what to say so that we can be a comfort to those who need comfort. We can be a strength to those who need strength. We can encourage them in the faith. So it became something that was no longer about the twelve no longer simply about the 12 or the 120, but now became something that is whosoever will, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And we believe that because the Holy Spirit is poured out, we can know what it is to then release the Holy Spirit, so to speak, into the lives of others beyond the walls of the church. Amen? E. Stanley Jones put it this way. Without the Holy Spirit, I am a mess. You ever felt like that? Without the Holy Spirit, I am a mess. With the Holy Spirit, I am a message. What a powerful statement. Is the Holy Spirit one that you know is real as the breath that you breathe? If not, I want you to know the Holy Spirit is God himself. We oftentimes will be comfortable with the idea of the Holy Spirit, or rather of, of God the Father. That concept of God the Father, God the Son, we can feel comfortable with that. But God the Holy Spirit, and especially if we've ever been in a church where he's been called the Holy Ghost, Asper, the friendly ghost, I mean, we feel like, uh-oh, this is like a ghost. Listen, 
The Holy Spirit is God himself, and the Holy Spirit was sent to us as a gift from, by Jesus when he ascended to the Father. That means I want the Holy Spirit. Jesus sends the Holy Spirit. I want the Holy Spirit. There's a lot of people who say, I've never really understood the Holy Spirit. I don't know what you're talking about to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I don't understand everything that's happening in this upper room at Pentecost. Well, I want you to know this is an experience that is a gift for us from God himself. The Holy Spirit is God on earth and can fill us to overflowing. and We can walk with the Holy Spirit throughout our lives. And I want that for, for all of us. Pentecost marks the day when ordinary people stepped forward and did extraordinary things. I'm telling you, if you look at that ragtag bunch, the more I look at the disciples, the more I wonder about them. You know, their, their beginnings were from all over the place. They were an unusual grouping, unusual individuals. This is not who you select if you're wanting to run an organization with excellence. I learned that the last couple of weeks. You wouldn't think this would be the group. But God selected those that were the disciples. He brought together this group of people that are flesh and blood, just like you and me. They weren't perfect. They didn't know everything to do. They didn't understand the future yet. All they knew was they were told that if they'd go to the upper room and, room and pray, that the Holy Spirit would come. That would give them an effectiveness and mission. It would be beyond, be beyond what they could understand. And so they did it. And when we think about it, they started in their own backyard of Jerusalem. We need to start in our own backyard of Arlington, Virginia. We need to start in our own backyard of the D.C. metro area. It will be effective here. God will carry us to the nations in the right moments where we're to go. Many of us will go out once or twice a year uh, on missions around the world. But we need to begin where we are. If we're always waiting for God to use us someday, then we're going to find that we'll get old one day and wonder what happened. We need to see God as God in the now, moving where we are in the now. Even as you leave here today, as you go to eat, wherever you go, I want you to know the Holy Spirit goes with you, will give you the right words to say, the presence of God himself, and you are a witness even when you're in Burger King. Let's lift our standards and say, Ruth's Chris. Okay. You remember Peter? Remember Peter denying Jesus? Now he stands at Pentecost being the leader of the early church. Do you remember Thomas? Remember his doubting? Well, it's believed that Thomas will carry the gospel east. In fact, tradition tells us that he'll carry the gospel to places like India. That's not the doubting Thomas that we hold him to and link him to throughout history. No, there was a boldness in him. He was even willing to go to Jerusalem with Jesus and die with Jesus when others were trying to find a way out. That's that doubting Thomas we talk about. But I'm telling you, when the Holy Spirit came in that upper room of Pentecost, he became bold as a lion. We can too. No longer were they hiding. No longer were they finding themselves scared of the authorities. Individuals hiding alone. But instead, these disciples had gathered together and found a unity and a purpose. The launching of the church is a fulfillment all that Jesus was saying would happen that they would experience. It went beyond what was just a belief system into something experiential. I hit that concept just for a moment of experiential. Because I believe that too many of us as believers have a conviction system that has never become an experience. Never become experiential. We pray out of tradition. We get used to God bless our meal prayers. That's not enough. This generation needs to stand up in full stature, filled with the Holy Spirit, praying prayers as big as God's heart. That's who we are. And if we will do that, I believe we'll begin to see more and more testimonies like we've been seeing through Capital Life Church, as people have come up on the stage and said, my life has been radically changed just the last few days. Isn't that beautiful when people give their testimonies? Because when people give their testimonies, all of a sudden it becomes real to us. This isn't just something in stained glass or in a creed that we put up on a wall. This is a living, vibrant relationship with God himself. The Holy Spirit can fill you up, guide you through life, he is the divine paraclete, which means the one called alongside to help. How many of you would like a little bit of help in life right now? My doctoral, I say amen. Acts 2.2. The Bible said again, suddenly 
sound like a, the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. I want to focus in on that concept of wind for just a moment because some of you, you know, you might feel like you'd like a little bit of wind to come through this place, you know. Uh, I know some churches, they have the little, you know, things and they love while the preacher's preaching to wave it at him and wave it at themselves. A little bit of wind. Well, there was a lot more wind than that with a young pastor who was preaching. Listen to the story. It's true. Mark Buchanan and his book, Hidden in Plain Sight, tells about a friend of his named Gary Nelson. Gary is an outstanding preacher, says Mark, but it wasn't always so. As the youth pastor at a large church early in his ministry, Gary wasn't often allowed in the pulpit. But when he was, he would preach long, dull sermons filled with Greek explications of long, tedious texts. One humid Pentecost Sunday, Gary was assigned to preach on the Holy Spirit. With the solemnness that only a young pastor can feel, Gary began with the opening verses of Genesis. Then he paused in the Psalms, then the prophets, then the Gospel of John. An hour into his sermon, the congregation was wilting in the heat, but he was just getting started. He strode into Acts and told the story of the first Pentecost. He told about the little band of Christians huddled together, praying fervently, joyful, joyful expectant. Then this young pastor reached a crescendo. The Holy Spirit hit like a tornado, cried out. Incredibly, says Mark Buchanan, at that very moment, every window in the sanctuary shattered, and a wind, swift and terrible, shrieked through the openings. The community had been struck at that very moment by a tornado. As it approached the church, it created a vacuum. When the pressure outside the church vastly exceeded the pressure inside, the window shattered. And it happened at the exact moment Gary described the coming of the Spirit on the first Pentecost. Wow, was that a sermon. Now, if we could do well here this morning, we'd shatter these out, but I don't think Walter would appreciate that and others in the building, but it would make an impact, wouldn't it? It would bring us to that point of understanding maybe a little bit better what it was like to be in that upper room on that day as what was like a mighty, violent wind came through on that uh, day of Pentecost. The largest tornado outbreak ever recorded, and I would believe this to be in the United States, April, this was in the United States, but I imagine that maybe there are others abroad, I don't know, but largest tornado outbreak ever recorded in the States, April of 2011, not long ago. It hit Virginia as well as a few other states, some of you may remember, through the south. Uh, it it raided some of the tornadoes that hit an EF-5. Some of you may know about that. EF-5s are the biggest tornado that can come. It's the highest ranking possibly. It's extremely possible. It's extremely rare. But four of them touched down on that very same day, killing an estimated 346 people. How many of you remember the movie Twister? Remember the cow? We all remember the cow. We may not remember other things. They came into Oklahoma to film that with Helen Hunt and others. And I remember when they came into Oklahoma uh, to film it. In Acts 2, there's no damage that's noted. There are some who say, well, maybe that was an actual tornado that was taking place. Well, I don't think so. There's no damage that's noted. I believe that's the power of God, the power of the Holy Spirit. What we know is that violent sound that took place. Uh, caused people to gather in mass. Remember, a half a million people in Jerusalem. They hear the violence of this storm sound, and they all come to find out what's going on in this little room, this upper room, this home. And they gathered together. Now, Oral Roberts made this statement, and I think it's true. He says, if you'll be on fire for God, people will come from miles around to watch you burn. I think that's true. We don't have enough people on fire for God. We don't have enough people believing God greatly for his Holy Spirit to move with miracles and power. But if we will pray this way, I am confident that in our day, in our generation, we will see that not only will our family members come to know Jesus, ones that perhaps have given up on themselves, ones that we prayed about fervently, and now we've gotten to a point where we wonder, I want you to know God will pour out his spirit if we will call upon him to do it. Are we ready to do it? If we will believe God, I, what happens 
in a church building like this, in a sanctuary when people just rise up to say, I believe in God and I will not limit him and I'm believing that if I repent and if I'll make my heart right before God and if I'll have ought against no man, but if I'll come together with others of like heart and we will begin to target our prayers and believe for God to move, then we can see revival in our day. We can see people come to know Jesus that others have given up. We can see healings happening in bodies and mind and spirit. We can see that miracles of provision can come. We can watch and see that the hearts of our leaders are changed as they walk through halls of power, but now are humble because they know that it's God that gives wisdom. They seek his wisdom. Halls of power. Why won't we believe for that? I believe we will. And as we believe, I believe that there are like-hearted people, and we're joining with them in prayer, and we'll see the Holy Spirit sweep over Arlington, Virginia. We'll see the Holy Spirit sweep over Washington, D.C., because people have planted seeds of faithfulness, and we're just jumping in in our generation, and we're believing that the seeds of faithfulness planted by people like Billy Graham and like others that are not known but have been planted in their day. I walked to that library. I saw the pictures and the footage of, of what were massive meetings of people crying out for God. And I said, God, do it in our day. Do it now. I respect history, but I want a now to the movement of God. And if we'll believe for a now, the Spirit of God, like a mighty wind, will rush through our hearts. We'll rush through our families. We'll rush through our church. We'll see God do mighty, mighty things. And people will come from miles around to watch us burn. Hebrew word for wind, spirit, it's the same word. In fact, the Hebrew word for wind and spirit is the same word as breath. It speaks to the fact that God breathes upon us. That concept of God breathing within man is that he gave man life. We need spiritual life. Got enough spiritual death everywhere. We need spiritual life. Somebody is filled with the life of God. I'm telling you, everybody takes you watched and seen a person who just loves God with all their heart and walks in the authority of God's presence and power, yet there's humility all over them. When they bow their heads to pray, they know God's listening. When they make a request of God, they're not making it, thinking they'll walk away with no result. They're believing for God to move. That's the type of person that inspires us all to say, I want that. I need that for my life. I've had my doubts. I've had my tough times. I haven't understood everything. But I want with all that I am to please God and to be God's man. And I believe you want to be God's man and God's woman. If we'll be that way, if we'll trust God, if we'll ask for the Holy Spirit to come upon us and do that, as Paul said in Ephesians, pray that prayer continually. Holy Spirit, fill me. So this is not something where you're looking for one dramatic stadium event. But instead, you're asking the Holy Spirit to fill you every day, that the agenda of God will be your agenda, so you won't set your own agenda. He'll guide you. You may have an agenda for the day. Don't get me wrong. I understand some of our jobs give that to us. But you'll be sensitive to the Holy Spirit that you'll be able to see that God sometimes gives divine interruptions, and those divine interruptions can be the very moments that change a person's life and impacts them forever. You can be used by God in that way. God wants us to know that if we'll come together in unity and if we'll pray, he'll move by his Holy Spirit. That's the word of God for you today. 1997, there was a Barna survey that was uh, taken. I want to share that with you. And, uh, and the thought of God being able to be experienced because God wants us to have an experiential relationship with him. Don't get me wrong. Your experience doesn't in some way step away from Scripture The Bible is always our foundation. If your experience tells you something other than the Bible, you don't have the experience of God. So we need to be careful there. I'm not putting experience over the Bible. Don't get me wrong. But to simply open the Bible without experience is, I believe, to disappoint God. Because if we'll open the Bible and believe that God wants to do now what we've read about in days of old, and that God can move now however uniquely he wants to do that, I believe we'll see the movement of God. Barna. 1997, research group conducted a survey of regular church attendees, asking them if they had experienced the presence of God during the past year. 
A startling 48% said they had not. When asked if they had ever experienced the presence of God in worship, nearly two-thirds responded in the negative. Well, I'm telling you, I'm so thankful that Capital Life Church is a different place than what we're talking about in coming out of this survey. It's time we experience God in worship. It's time that we experience God in hearing his word. It's time that we experience God in our prayer times, our devotional life. Amen? Amen. Then there's a, uh, another thing about experiencing God, just a thought here that I want to share with you. Tom Rayner, who is the Billy Graham Professor of Evangelism at Southern Baptist Seminary, did a recent survey on the classical question that Billy Graham asks. The question he asks is, if you died today, do you know for certain that you would go to heaven? This is what people answered. 65% of the builder generation, age 60 and up, said yes. 65%. 35% of the boomer generation, ages 40 to 59, said yes. 15% of the buster generation, ages 28 to 39, said yes. 4% of the bridger generation, ages 17 to 28, said yes to the question, if you died today, do you know for certain that you would go to heaven? Folks, we've got it cut out for us. And if not us, who? We are the church. And on this celebration of the church's birthday, if we'll rise up, and recognize that it's our birthday. We stand on the shoulders of individuals like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, like Joseph and Esther, Moses and Noah. I think of all the ones, Elijah and Elisha, Peter and Paul, Stephen and others. We stand on their shoulders, such so great a cloud of witnesses. They had witnessed the, the works of God in their generation. They had witnessed what God had done. I believe they're witnessing us as well. They're applauding us, saying it's your turn. Pray big prayers. Don't be limited. Be filled with the Spirit of God. John Newton, many of you know who he is. John Newton, the author of Amazing Grace. And uh, in the younger adult years of his life, he was the captain of a slave ship. Some of you may have seen Amazing Grace, the movie. One of the most despicable things that could ever be done is what he did as being the captain of that slave ship. Later became a Christian, entered the ministry, became an abolitionist, uh, working to end slavery. His conversion to Christ was brought about by several factors. Now, I want you, the reason why I'm telling this story is we have a lot of denominations that don't believe that God moves by his spirit today. We have a lot of people who limit that, and they're called cessationists, and the, the idea is that cessation, the gifts of the spirit, ceased with the early church. There are a lot of people that believe that. I'm not one of those. John Newton, he had an experience that all these, and it ended up being why he wrote one of, the, one of the precipitating factors for writing Amazing Grace, sung by those same people who think that God in some way ceased what he does by his spirit as to how he did it in the early uh, days, in the New Testament days. John Newton's conversion to Christ was brought about by several factors. One was a dream. In this dream, he accidentally dropped a sacred ring into the sea from the deck of his ship. Jesus appeared, saw that Newton had lost an incredible treasure. Jesus offered to dive into the water and retrieve this ring, like the ring given to the prodigal. When John Newton awoke, he knew that he had had a deeply personal, emotional, spiritual experience. And he wrote Amazing Grace. People seeing it, thinking that maybe God doesn't give dreams today. But I can tell you, God does give dreams today, and God does speak to us today, and God does move today. Then J.B. Phillips wrote a book, and that book is called Your God is Too Small. I like the title. I've never read the book. I just love the title. <laughs> Your God is Too Small. The wind at Pentecost shouted out that our God is not too small. Let's look at Acts, the second chapter, fifth verse. To the 12th verse, the Bible says, now there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard the sound, the crowd came together in bewilderment, because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? How is it that each of us hear them in our native language? 
And it goes on to name the various groups that were there. Uh, and it says uh, in the 11th verse, um, Cretans and Arabs, et cetera, et cetera, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? They heard in their own language. There are people that are all around us that are waiting to hear that God loves them in a language that they can understand. People that are waiting for us to translate the good news story into their lives. Last thing I want to read to you out of the things that I brought here is, out of, is has to do with Wycliffe. Wycliffe states, states and excuse my voice, <clears throat> been using it too much in my doctoral class, and uh, I'm going for that 10% participation grade. <laughs> <clears throat> Thank you. Wycliffe states that there are 6,000 languages in the world today. But the 3,500 languages uh, yet are only oral and have to be put in written language and the Bible translated into them. We who use the English language sometimes forget that the knowledge of other languages is imperative for the spread of the gospel. Bill Bryson, in his book, The Mother Tongue, English and How It Got That Way, says that English has become the language to know It is spoken by a third of the world's population, two-thirds, all scientific papers, half of all European business deals, and 70% of all the mail in the world are written in English. But the language native to the disciples on the day of Pentecost was not English, but Aramaic. Luke is careful to say that all the visitors that were in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost, the Jews uh, of dispersion, Uh, spoke many languages. These people had come from all parts of the known world for the feast, and they heard the disciples speak in their own native tongue. In the days ahead, I want to share with you demographics. I want you to know the people that are are in our own backyard. I want you to know about the D.C. metro area. I want you to know that we want to be effective in reaching them and go outside the walls of the church. Amen? Holy Spirit is breaking down barriers. The Holy Spirit is breaking down all the barriers that have been placed up by the enemy, trying to keep people from the the Spirit of God and the gospel message. Stand to your feet. I want to just say this out of Isaiah 54, 2, and then we're going to pray. Isaiah 54, 2 is one of my favorites. The Bible says, enlarge the place of your tent. Stretch your tent curtains wide. Do not hold back. Lengthen your cords. Strengthen your tent. I want you to consider this for just a moment, and I shared out of Isaiah 54 two weeks ago about, O oh, barren woman, speaking to Israel, more are the children of your womb. I mean, just an amazing scripture. But then the second verse, enlarge the place of your tent. Your tent is your realm of influence. A tent is where you would have your family in Bible days. And if you enlarge the place of your tent, it meant that you were actually drawing more people into your realm of influence. You were influencing them to a greater degree. Time for us to spread out our tents. Time for us to recognize that God wants us to be able to bring the influence of the gospel into the lives of more people than you right now think you're touching.